Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Wish Wilson. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I'll just get to the heart of the matter for the Australian Greens on this uh, legislation we're debating today that enables the Chinese, the so-called Chinese free trade deal. <laughs> that is, we have a fundamentally flawed and broken treaty-making process in this country. Therefore, the legislation we see before us today is also reflecting a fundamentally flawed and broken trade deal with China. This deal, the Chinese free trade deal, was negotiated in secret. At no stage was the Australian parliament or the people it represents asked why we would be seeking to negotiate this agreement or what we wanted from it. At no stage was the expertise or insights of businesses, unions, academics or a host of other interested parties called upon to help inform the government on the implications of this deal, whether the provisions in the deal were in the national interest or whether the whole deal was in the national interest. And there was no transparency around the negotiations. Chapter has been initiated and agreed to by the executive of a government and presented to a parliament as a take it or leave it prospect. Once these secret trade deals are signed by the executive, there's no way of changing the de detail in the deal. And the milieu that follows is familiar. There's an overhyping of benefits. The government has literally exponentially inflated the number of jobs. And I'm glad they did clear that up in the Senate recently. And there's a confected sense of urgency we must sign this now. It's absolutely critical, is the chant. Free trade is being presented as being inherently good, and those who speak out against are accused of being xenophobic and anti-trade. And I refer to the Trade Minister's comments over the weekend to the ABC that after five years of secret negotiations with the release of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, those who have been following this very closely and have significant expertise in this area who have raised concerns are immediately called hysterical and attacked by the government. I mean, the gall, the nerve of Minister Robb releasing a secret deal, finally providing the details. Well, I've got to say it wasn't all the details because the side letters, the hundreds of side letters with all the details weren't released to the public. They are now being looked at. The gall to attack people who are actually questioning a fundamentally undemocratic process and the outcomes which have been given to us, being attacked by the Trade Minister for raising concerns. Against this backdrop, the J. Scott Committee is meant to provide a calm and reasoned assessment to inform the government of the day and, to a large extent, the committee report provides this. However, as is the pattern, the subsequent recommendations are either inadequate or non-existent and do not reflect the content of the committee report. On free trade, the committee has unfortunately become a rubber stamp to the executive. There are serious problems with this agreement that we're debating today. It's lopsided. The projected economic benefits are based on faulty modelling and on labour mobility. Chapter reads like the Korean free trade deal and appears to be creating a parallel industrial relations system. Let's make this very clear. This deal, like CAFTA and like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is a deregulation agenda in the labour market. It is designed to set up a parallel industrial relations system in this country. Let's look at this a little bit closer. Senator Wong mentioned that it's taken 10 years to, to get to Parliament and that Labor had a, had a say in the various stages of this deal. And it's also reflect on the Korean free trade deal, how long that took to come to parliament. Labor didn't complete that deal while they were in government. And a really good question is to ask yourself why. Why didn't Labor complete the Korean free trade deal or the Chinese free trade deal? Well, the issues around labor market, whether it be around labor market testing, labor mobility, these were fundamental issues for the Labor Party while they were in government. They are fundamentally concerning issues for the union movement. We know there's a lot of concern in the union movement around 457 visas as they stand now. The rorting of the system, the lack of regulation 
the lack of auditing of standards, of licences. These issues are being talked about by the union movement in church halls around the country as we speak. They are talking to their members about the concerns they have around the deregulation of the labour market through these trade deals. So, Labor didn't sign them when they were in government. They didn't complete them. We had the issue with the car industry, the straw that broke the camel's back, the Korean free trade deal. The car industry CEOs themselves said it would be the straw that broke the camel's back. Potentially hundreds and thousands of workers and their families out of, out of work because of these trade deals. So the question then becomes, why are Labor supporting these deals now? And I'll get back to that before I finish, if they did have concerns while they were in government. I want to get to the issue of investor state dispute settlement clauses, where we give corporations special rights, special rights to sue sovereign governments if they feel that legislation or policies impact on their profits, future profits, or the value of their investment. On this issue, in the Chinese free trade deal, of whether Chinese corporations should be able to sue our government for public policy changes, Australia, our government, appears content for the EU and US to sort out that for us at a later date. We have an open-ended ISDS clause in this Chinese free trade deal. And we're told by DFAT that in a few years' time they'll fully finish the ISDS clause and negotiate it at some point in the future. And that China's not ready to finish the detail on this yet because they're in their infancy in terms of moving into the trade deal space. So we're being asked in this parliament to sign up for an ISDS clause that is open-ended. Now, the Greens fundamentally oppose giving corporations special rights to sue our sovereign government. We fundamentally oppose that. I have put a bill up in this parliament to have them banned. And the evidence, comprehensive evidence from around the world, from a number of experts, is we don't need them. They don't add anything to labour mobility between countries. There's no evidence at all that they support so-called free trade. But what we do know is that they add risk. They add risk and directly challenge the sovereignty of our governments. We don't need them. Now, Senator Wong was interesting in her language. She said, she said that while Labor haven't traditionally supported ISDS clauses, that they would, uh, if I got the quote right, seek to amend, seek to amend these clauses when they get to government. Now, our view as Greens is that they can't be amended, they can't be fixed. They fundamentally should not be in secret trade deals. This is not the road we want to go down, giving corporations more power to influence our parliament. Anyone who's been a senator or a member of parliament, not just in federal parliament but in state parliament, know how much power corporations already have over the functionings of our democracy. We all know about the special interest effect and the power that corporations wield on the legislation and the outcomes that we, as representatives of the Australian people, produce in parliament. But to give them special rights to go a step further in shady parallel legal systems with no right of repeal, no transparency, is fundamentally unacceptable. Now, I haven't time to debate the TPP today, but it has been some attempts to try and provide some disincentives for corporations to bring these cases. But let me tell you, once again, evidence-based, every wording of a previous IDS clause has failed to stop corporations from bringing strategic litigation. They are set up to give corporations the right to challenge regulations in the public interest, be it around public health, be it around environment and be it around labour, labour laws in our country. And I will be moving a second reading amendment, uh, Acting Deputy President, when I finish the speech on that particular issue, that we remove ISDS clauses from the Chinese free trade deal. And I just want to emphasise before I move on that in this case it is exceptional that we're being asked to support an open-ended 
by SDS clause that hasn't even been finished in its detail yet. Hasn't even been finished in its detail yet. Now, I would also disagree on Senator Wong's point that this deal brings significant benefits to this country. There's no doubt in some sectors of our economy that this deal will bring benefits to producer groups and to some industries. And I want to make it very clear that the Australian Greens believe we should be seeking to consolidate economic relations with China, our largest trading partner and the second largest economy in the world. Further open and transparent trade relations help breed trust between nations, which can in turn help bring a more peaceful and prosperous world. However, in its current form, TAFTA is not a good deal. It is not in our national interest and we don't feel it should be supported. So let's get back to these significant economic benefits. Now, we've uh, had a couple of interesting questions without notice here in the Senate on this exact issue. And I think we all know now that the government, as is always the case with these secret trade deals, they hold the cards, they have the detail. We don't see it until it's signed. And by that stage, they've given drops to newspapers and it's on the front page of the news and on the bulletins and on TV about the, the billions of dollars of wealth it's going to create for our country, all the agricultural producers it's going to benefit, and uh, hundreds and thousands of jobs that it's going to create. Well, and Mr Rob's direct quotes in relation to the free trade deals we signed with China, Japan and South Korea was that this, these were a landmark set of agreements which will see literally billions of dollars, billions of dollars, thousands, many hundreds and thousands of jobs, and will underpin a lot of our prosperity in the years ahead. Well, the evidence doesn't suggest that. In fact, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. All of these three deals, not just one, not just the Chinese deal, which we're debating today, all of these deals, when looking at the DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's independent modelling, contradict these claims by Minister Robb. Their analysis estimates these agreements will increase GDP by 0.05 per cent in 20 years' time, or an additional $780 million per year in today's terms, and would increase employment in, in 2035 in total by 5,434 jobs. Now, that's very different to hundreds and thousands of jobs that we've heard in this place and elsewhere by the Trade Minister. My point is these deals are highly politicised. They are highly politicised. And when we get to the detail, they always, always overpromise and underdeliver. The evidence is there from the US free trade deal, which was going to pave the roads with gold 10 years ago and has recently been modelled as having almost no effect on our economy. And we all know the technical theoretical jargon around trade diversion with bilateral trade deals and that they never deliver what they promise. Yet we still go through this rigmarole in our national debate and in this Senate about how great they're going to be for our economy. And we always ignore the risks. They're always winners and always losers in trade deal. Any first year economic student will tell you that. And in theory, the winners compensate the losers. And that's how we're all better off. That's how we're all better off. We don't even do an analysis of who the losers are going to be. But at least the Labor movement, at least the Labor movement in this country is standing up on this issue of deregulation of labour markets, because they know they will be losers under these deals if there's not adequate regulation around labour market testing, skills assessments and other important issues. And I'll look forward to moving amendments when we go in committee on this particular issue. So I won't go into detail now, Acting Deputy President. I can deal with that uh, a little bit later. So free trade deals are about spin, a lot of spin. And there's very little evidence that they live up to the hype. Yet, yet uh, our governments are happy to shove this down our throat. If you dare criticise the minister on issues around trade or raise perfectly valid questions. And I would say, in relation to the 
the broken and fundamental, fundamentally flawed treaty process. This is not just the view of the Greens. Numerous Senate committees have recommended uh, exactly this issue. In fact, recently, when the Defence, Foreign Affairs and Trade Committee looked at the chapter, which we're debating here today, uh, they said they highlighted in Chapter 5 in their conclusions and recommendations that the Senate had completed a previous significant inquiry into the treaty making process, and it had four key findings that essentially we need to incorporate into any future trade deal. And the recommendations are that an independent analysis be undertaken prior to the commencement of negotiations, as well as an evaluation of likely costs and benefits after negotiations have concluded through some uh, body such as a Productivity Commission. We grant access to draft treaty texts for people to see the detail, and we have a creation of a model trade agreement that cover controversial topics. And this is what the, the conclusion that the, that the, the, uh, the Senate drew, uh, Acting Deputy President. The committee's inquiry to chapter illustrate that these findings and recommendations have continuing relevance. It is worth considering whether the issues with the labour mobility components of chapter would have surfaced if improvements to the treaty making process had been made. In the view of the committee, it is possible these issues could have been appropriately resolved before the final text was agreed. In this context, the committee reiterates its recommended reforms to the treaty making process. It's recommended reforms to the treaty making process. If we don't fix that, if we don't fix that going forward, we are always going to be having the same politicised debates about something as important as trade. About something as important as trade. Where there are always winners and there are always losers. And that is why the Greens fundamentally are a party of fair trade. Fair trade, where the opportunities aren't just open to a few through the trade deal process, the treaty process, but the opportunities at least are there to be scrutinised by everyone. Opportunity for all. Because at the moment, at the moment I've got no doubt that those groups that have their ministers here, and we've seen with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, 500 corporations had access to the draft treaty making process, whereas civil society and others were invited along to the odd show and tell but were shown no detail at all. These corporatised trade agreements don't provide opportunity for all. That is our view as the Greens. Uh, we fundamentally question the logic behind trickle-down economics that are attached to these trade deals and what it has delivered for the community. But we do support trade, but we want to see that it's fair and that externalities, such as environmental externalities and social externalities, are incorporated into these deals so that we do have a balance and that we do have fair trade. And that is going to be a big issue with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement in coming months, no doubt. But interesting to note that the Chinese Free Trade Deal doesn't even have a labour, a labour chapter. And it doesn't have an environment chapter, unlike at least the Korean deal did. It doesn't even include those issues. And I've got to say, with the Investment Facilitation Agreement, Acting Deputy President, it's the first time in a trade deal that we've seen an IFA as a side letter, as an annex of the deal, be included in a trade deal. And I asked DFAT recently at Estimates who proposed the IFA, knowing it must be Australia, because that's, one of, that's a, a process that we use, and they admitted that they proposed to Chinese the addition of an IFA to help facilitate the trade deal. So that's more evidence, if you need it, that the Chinese were playing hardball on labour access arrangements and on labour mobility. And there's no doubt, there's no secret that all around the world where the Chinese have invested, they have liked to vertically integrate. They have liked to bring their own labour and their own expertise and their own skills, to, particularly around significant direct foreign investment. So I don't think it's any secret that that was a barrier for the Chinese to sign this deal. And I intend to get into more detail around labour mobility issues when I move amendments uh, in committee. And I want to conclude. This enabling legislation supports a fundamentally flawed deal. And that is because our treaty and trade negotiation process in this country is fundamentally flawed. It, if we don't make a stand on that, then it'll never be fixed. It'll never be fixed. And when I look at the benefits, so-called benefits of these deals, I don't believe that they are going to bring significant economic and jobs 
to this country. But they do introduce significant risks to labour markets and to our sovereignty by allowing ISDS. And the Greens fundamentally oppose corporatised secret trade deals. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. I'll just